For everyone living in Israel, you all know that this week is Pesach, Passover. What we sometimes lose sight of as the year comes around and everyone is slaving in their kitchen or mostly their mothers or their Polish grandmother is slaving in the kitchen getting ready for the Seder is that this is a remarkable event in human history. We don't put enough focus on what a remarkable event this was in human history. You have a people, however many they are, who is subjugated, enslaved in Egypt for 210 years. Cheap, free labor, controlled under the finger of Paro of Pharaoh. And comes a guy, Moshe, Moses, who grew up in the house of the Pharaoh. He's an outsider though now for some 60, 70 years. And he comes back and says, I'd like to introduce you to a new term. It's called freedom. And in fact, all of these people are going to be free. They're not going to be your slaves. They're not going to be regulated by you. You're not going to tell them what they need to build, how they need to build it. But they're going to be free to go out and do what they please. Now, after the Jewish people leave Egypt, they take a stop. And the first stop they take is at Har Sinai at Mount Sinai where first they need to learn something because you can't take a people that's been used to being slaves for 210 years and just say, go. It doesn't work. You have a slave mentality. You're not the master of your own time. You don't understand what that means even to be free or the master of your own time. This is a revolution. You don't understand that we're not free people three and a half thousand years ago in the world. There were kings and rulers and slaves. That's what there were. By the way, 200 years ago, there weren't too many free people in the world either, right? There were serfs who served their masters. So now they come out and they need to learn something. And for the first time, we don't pay enough attention to this, as Moshe, Moses presents the Torah, he says, you can own land. And when you get to the land of Israel, you will own your own land. You will be responsible for tilling the land. They'll have a pretty low tax rate. It's only one-tenth. But land ownership for a people that's been slaved for 210 years is revolutionary. We don't, we don't give specific, sufficient attention to the revolution of Moshe, of Moses, taking people out of slavery, taking them to a land and saying, here's your own land, you own it, work it, enjoy the fruits of your own labor. Don't forget to say thank you. Don't forget to take care of unfortunate people, but it's yours. You have a source of income for the first time in your life. You're not being allocated by the Pharaoh, by the central government. Here's what you need to have. Here's what you need to make. Here's what you need to do. This is a complete and total revolution. I, I encourage you to stop and think about world history. And think about, in however many thousands of years of world history there have been, how long... People have been free to provide for themselves. How long people have been free to innovate? How long people have been free to study and learn and thereby enrich their future? In fact, if you think about it, you are living in the single most fortunate generation in human history where all of the powers of creation are in your hands. There has never Never, ever in the history of humankind been a generation like this where every human being on the planet can create in an almost unfettered way. And I'll come to the almost in a second. It's, it's unusual. You're extraordinarily fortunate. We are extraordinarily fortunate people. And what happens is, if you have the vast majority of the population under thumb being held down and unable to progress by governments, by controlling monopolies, by people who control production, humankind is less productive. Countries are less productive. I was joking with somebody the other day that had Pharaoh, Paro, simply unleashed the Jewish people in Egypt he could have had those pyramids built in a lot less than 210 years. When you control people and you centralize it, they have no motivation to work. 
to have no motivation to do anything, he didn't unleash their creativity on the world. Now, fast forward to today. I mentioned that we all have the power of creation in our hand. This little object here is not just for WhatsApping or texting or, or emailing. It's actually a creation device. You can create things, and I'll come talk about that in a second. It's the great leveler of the economic playing field. But we're in a war as a country. Chile's in a war as a country. The United States is in a war as a country. I'd argue that every country on this planet is in a war. And we're in a war for something really important. You know what that is? Human creativity. For the last 100 years, 120 years maybe, as the Industrial Revolution ripped through the world, we created an economy based, for the most part, on production at scale, lowering the cost of production, mass production, and the mass production of labor. The educational system in the world trained people to work in factories. It trained people to be part of the industrial machine of the 20th century. That brought incredible prosperity to the world. Incredible prosperity. We found low-cost low, low sources of production, outsourced a ton to China, shipped a ton across the world. We are able to scale up and provide for the increase of humanity by freeing up the ability to produce things like vaccination. We increased lifespan more than 2x almost. In many countries in the world, 3x. It's unbelievable. What's been unleashed in the last 100 years is truly remarkable. If you look around the world, though, and compare the progress of the last 100 years, you'll note something incredible. Which are the countries that you're aware of that have progressed the fastest and the furthest? Also, the United States, Israel, places where I can get access to capital, I can invest the capital, I can then produce and output things that the human mind has come up with and created. Today, today, in the last 20 years, we have accelerated into an information economy, or I prefer to call an innovation economy, the likes of which the world has never seen. The computing power in this device, in this device, does anyone know on a dollar basis how much it's increased in 20 years? The computing power in this device could be found not even in a supercomputer 25 years ago. That's how fast we've come. Took up a huge room like this, right? We come very far, very fast. And what we've done is we've reduced things that we've spent tons of money, tons of production on. Think about printing presses, think about all the other things you need into this little device. And therefore, that which we can access is only limited but what, by what the human creative mind, the innovative mind, the technological spirit can think of. Think about how many years it took to create the mechanized plow, a lot. Tens of years till it got to production. 20 years into smartphones, 20 years into smartphones, five years into smartphones, seven years into smartphones, how many smartphones do we have? 6.7 million? No, those, those are cell phones. We don't have cell phones, 6.7 million subscribers to cell phones. Smartphones are over 3 billion, I think. We're out already. And it's in everybody's hands, and it's in everywhere. So I go back to what I was saying before. We are in a war for talent, for innovative people who can innovate and bring value to this device, which has huge computing power, is available anywhere, and will replace almost everything. Almost every physical object that you can think of, save for transportation, and refrigeration, food production, can be replaced in this, many of them. I actually even saw this week somebody 3D printing food, so maybe even that, right? It's coming. It's coming. So if, if those of you have seen Star Trek, you know they can produce food. So now we're in a global war for talent. The state of Israel is in a global war for talent, except we have a problem. What's the problem? Misrata Pnim, the interior ministry. The amount of regulation, 
thank God there's 8 million Israelis in this country. It's a pretty intelligent country. We have great people who are super innovative. But guess what we have a shortage of? Engineering talent, innovative people, artists. There's a shortage. Why? Because there's 8 billion people in the world that we want to service in a connected economy. And he who is innovative has an opportunity in a globalized, connected economy to serve the entire world and create prosperity for the entire world from this little country. For the first time in history, the state of Israel doesn't have to call a Bezek and get a line or ship things on a Zim ship. You can create some innovation, upload it on our phone, and the next second, it's in Beijing and San Francisco and wherever. But we have a shortage of people. We have a shortage of people who can do this. I want to tell you a story that happened literally last week. I get an email and it says, Michael, maybe you can help. And it's about a guy, his name will be withheld. He's American. And he moved to Israel two years ago because he loved Israel. He's not Jewish. He loved Israel. He came here. He's hanging around Tel Aviv. He's been working at a software company and he's in love with the country. He's a highly productive employee at this software company. He only earns 40,000 shekels a month because that's what great software engineers earn today. That's a, highly, that's a pretty good job, right? 40,000 shekels a month. They turn up at his door one night, knock, knock. It's the interior ministry. Sorry, sir, pack your bags. You're out of here in a week. Why? You don't have a visa to work here. Why? Because the only way to get a visa is either to be Jewish, and then you become a citizen, or you can get an expert's visa. An expert's visa, you need to be an expert at something. But if you're an independent software programmer, there's no way to prove you're a better expert than the next guy. You're just talented. Sorry, leave. So the regulator, the Interior Ministry, which somehow finds a way to bring in 10,000 Thailandi agricultural workers who don't contribute to the economy, and we'll come to the absurdity of this in a second, finds a guy who earns 40,000 shekel, pays taxes, okay, a month. He creates something innovative that creates jobs and sends it across, and we said, see ya. So I called the chief scientist, who's a friend of mine, and we called the head of the absorption ministry and the head of the ministry of the interior, and they said, sorry, we can't help him. He didn't fit a category. We got rules. I said, well, how come we can bring in 10,000 Thailandis to work the field? What do you think the answer to that question was? We don't need to protect those jobs for Israelis. No Israeli will do that job. Again, we don't need to protect those jobs for Israelis. Israelis won't do that job. They think they're taking care of you. This paternalistic attitude that we know we're protecting the jobs. Now, don't misunderstand me. I'd like every Israeli to work. They do. We have almost no unemployment in this country. But if we don't bring in powers of production into the innovation economy and open up the borders for global movement of talent, and yes, I'm aware of the Jewish character of the state, in case you're wondering, I'm not worried about it. If we got 100,000 great software engineers, we'd increase the GDP tremendously here. We wouldn't harm the Jewish character of the state, I promise. And we just bring them in. And instead, through government regulation that were created, by the way, in the 70s, it turns out, I found that out this week, you cannot bring talented people into Israel except under absolutely extenuating circumstances. You're a woman with one ear who happens to be the only people's person who speaks Swahili. Then you're an expert. It's impossible. And the, the, the basic currency of trade today is not dollars. And it's not goods and services. It's human creativity and human talent. That is the single most important input into a growing economy. So when we search for freedom in an economy, what we need to find is freedom of movement of people. We need to open a border to enable talented people to come in. Why? Another thing we know importantly is that cross-cultural interactions, interactions between different people, in particular in cities, creates a lot of ingenuity, a lot of innovation. There's been a tremendous number of studies in Berkeley for some reason out of this, in Columbia University. Density and heterogeneity creates innovation. Density and heterogeneity creates innovation. Well, if we all look the same, we all grew up the same, and we don't meet other people, how are we going to innovate? Yeah, we're smart, we're intelligent, everything's true. 
But it's not enough. It's not enough. Then what you find is, eventually you get to some innovation. And my favorite example of this is Uber. And it's particularly good that we're talking in Israel and not just in Las Vegas. How many of you have used Uber in this? How many know what Uber is? Uber? Uber. Uber. So you got a phone, you get an app on the phone, right? And you go, I'd like a car. Notice I didn't say the word taxi. I'd like a car. And anyone who wants to drive a car and drive someone around can sign up to be an Uber driver and they turn up and they get rated for their service and they get paid a market wage. By the way, it's more than a taxi driver makes because the optimization algorithms are so good. And anyone can be a driver. You don't need to get a license. The state doesn't get to decide if you are suitable to be a taxi driver. No, the customer gets to decide if you're good enough. And if I give you a one-star rating, you won't be back the next time. But if I give you a five-star rating, it's likely you will be back the next time. And this thing is exploding. Benchmark, my firm that I was at, is an investor in Uber. Trust me, it's exploding. OK, I get a call from the CEO, Travis Kalanick. He says, Michael, we're ready for Tel Aviv. Ready? Great, Travis. How can I help? Meet our guys. So poor Sweethi, who's Indian, turns up here for two months. She's the international city launcher. And they hire Yoni, local Israeli guy. And they're going to be the city launcher for Tel Aviv. Who can tell me how many Uber cabs there are in Tel Aviv today? No, there's more than that. There's 15 lawbreakers. One five lawbreakers. In the States, you have what's called UberX, which is what I described before. If you want to be an Uber driver, you want to earn some extra money while you're studying, you can go be an Uber driver. God bless. It's amazing. Make some money. Why not? Don't flip burgers. Go drive a car. Meet interesting people. By the way, that's the best. You go to San Francisco, you get interviewed by the Uber driver. So I asked one of them once, do you always ask your passengers these questions? He says, oh, yes. This is how I'm doing my college education. I thought it was brilliant. <laughs> it was genius. Anyway, so Tel Aviv is 15. Three weeks ago, Yoni calls me. He says, Michael, SOS. Who do we know at the transportation ministry? I said, well, why do you need to talk now to the transportation ministry? He says, well, it's not enough that we can't get UberX going because you need a license with a tachanat moniot, with a cab dispatcher, in order to drive a cab in this country. Now, Uber was operating under a temporary license to be a cab dispatcher. We can't even have the cab dispatcher license, so we're being put out of business. So you can't get an Uber. OK, now I ask you a question. I don't know how much money you earn. But if you're in New York and you pick up a New York City taxi cab from John F. Kennedy Airport to Manhattan, how much are you going to pay? $65 plus tolls, which is about $13. And if you pick up an Uber X, how much are you paying? $45. So if you're able to pick up an Uber X in Tel Aviv, what would happen to what they call here, Yokir Amichia, the cost of living? Go down. Why is your cost of living not going down? There's the taxi lobbying because the bureaucrats won't let you order you on at will. They think they know better who's driving a cab. What's the requirement to drive a cab here? Do you know? Driver's license? Well, how come you can't drive it? You don't have a driver's license? How do you get a number? You pay who? Someone pays the Minister of Transportation, and then they trade in that number. So if you want to trade, drive a taxi and you don't have a number, what do you do? Pay there. So the same thing happened in New York. Here's the most interesting thing. The stock market in the United States has more than doubled since the crash of 2008. OK? There's something else that's crashed in New York City since then. Does anyone know what that is? What? The value of a taxi medallion. In 2008, a taxi medallion in New York City could be sold for $1 million. Today, it's not even worth $50,000. It's gone down 90% in value. You know why? Freedom. No regulation. It enables people to order a cab. It enables you if you want to drive a cab. Or not a cab, an UberX, my car. It doesn't matter. But the taxi lobby is angry. And you know who's even angrier? the politicians and the bureaucrats, because they make their living either getting paid off by the taxi drivers or voted for by the taxi driver lobby, who they can organize as one body and drive them to the polls to come vote for them. You want another example? Airbnb. 
Who's stayed in an Airbnb before? Is this awesome Airbnb? Right? It's fun. It's cool. It's cheap. It's cheap. Now, I want you to pay attention to what Airbnb does. This is a beautiful hotel. Who knows what it costs to build this hotel? Yes? I don't know either. $20 million? $15 million? Oh, right? Something like that. Now, if your parents are older and you've moved out of your house already and you don't go back there and they've got three extra bedrooms because they had three kids, that is an underutilized resource in the economy. Dramatically underutilized. How much does it cost to build a hotel out of your mother's spare bedroom that you left? How much? Zero. How much can your mother earn if she can rent it out for $60 a night? $60. <laughs> and it's beautiful. And how do I access that? Two guys. You know how Airbnb started? Here's how it started. There was a conference in San Francisco. Uh, I think it was an Oracle conference. And there were no hotel rooms available in San Francisco. Why? Because it takes 10 years to build a hotel until you get all the licenses you need and raise the money and build the hotel. They had a couple of buddies who wanted to stay. They rolled out some air mattresses because they needed to make a couple of bucks and put it on Craigslist and said, $5 for an air mattress. That's why it's called Airbnb, because it was an air mattress. So they used unutilized space, and their air mattress, they'd only paid 50 bucks for it, and tried to make some money. Then they turned it into business. The whole business, two guys, started by writing software, first for a website and then for a phone. They built a global hotel business and never spent a nickel on cement. A, it is the largest hotel chain on the entire planet, and they never spent a nickel on cement. A nickel. And how many people did they enable to earn a living? How many? Anyone know? How many people have rented a place in Airbnb, have rented out their place in Airbnb? Does anyone know? 600,000. 600,000 people around the world, last I checked, have rented out a place on Airbnb and made an extra income. Taxable? What's the problem? Who knows what's going on in Tel Aviv right now? And New York City too. Anyone know? What happens if you rent your apartment in Tel Aviv out on Airbnb? Do you know? You're liable to get fined 5,000 shekels. You know why? Why? Because you didn't pay hundreds of thousands of dollars to get a hotel license in Tel Aviv. It's regulated. It's deeply regulated. Now, who went to the government and said, oh, Gverit Cohen, Mrs. Cohen, she's an Avaryan. She's breaking the law. Who went and did that? Not Mrs. Cohen, not her neighbor either. Maybe here, right? The hotel lobby. They went there and said, this is a terrible idea. We shouldn't let people make any money. That's terrible. We shouldn't utilize the resources. Instead, we should dig another big hole in the ground pour piles of cement that's bad for the environment, put people in there, block the view. Oh, we've got 20,000 extra bedrooms in Tel Aviv? No, they should stay empty. So we end up with an economy, when it's regulated to this extent, that has a terrible utilization of resources. It neither allows for the freedom of movement of talent to be attracted to a place where it can combust together and create better, more innovative things that drive down costs. We were talking at the table before, by the way. There's a lot of demagoguery about income gaps, okay? Now it's true, income gaps are really complicated. Don't misunderstand me. It's really complicated. There's social issues in it. There's a lot. And it's not okay that people who are less fortunate get treated poorly by the government, by the bureaucrats, I'll tell you a story about that in a second, et cetera, and by other people. However, we don't pay attention to what the working hour, I was just telling someone about the paper by Brad DeLong from 1997, you ought to read it. What does a working hour buy today as opposed to 20 years ago? Innovation drove down the cost of refrigerators from what would it take you 200 hours to work and buy a refrigerator to 20. So you work a lot less, you've got a refrigerator, which means you can store food. We don't talk about the fact that the automobile, the automobile, means it doesn't take a week to go to town anymore from your farm to the city. You can go there in an hour. You saved a lot of time. That's worth a lot of money. We don't talk about the fact that if I can video conference on my cell phone 
without having to get on a plane, I've saved a lot of money. And it cost me nothing. If you wanted a video conference 10 years ago, you needed to be a company the size of General Motors. I have the money of General Motors. Today, any kid in Demona could video conference around the world. Anybody. So the cost of that has gone down dramatically. So this begs the question of what do we do in order to create more innovation in our economy? Because more innovation means lower prices, more innovative ideas that you can then spread to the world. And what else does it mean? More prosperity for everybody in the economy. More prosperity. So um, before I jump into that, and uh, Jose and I were talking about it outside, I want to tell you a story that's happened in the last four weeks because it brings it home. So I keep taking out my phone. How many of you have heard of a company called Meerkat in the last four weeks? Anyone? Okay. Meerkat is a little company in uh, Yafo, in Jaffa, founded by three guys, Ben, Itai, and Uri. Um, and they democratized them. How much did that camera cost you? $5,000. $5,000. You're recording me. Can you broadcast that to the States live right now? I uh, could if I added another little box on it. You yeah. got a little box. So I'll just do it for you instead. So I just uh, turned on the broadcaster. It's a piece of software developed in, uh, in Yafo. We'll turn the camera around so you can see everybody. But you'll see that soon people will come on and want to hear what it is that I'm talking about. Here, what is the cost of that software? So far, zero people are watching. I'm not that interesting. What was the cost of creating this software? There's now seven people watching, by the way. Does anyone know what the cost of creating this software was? The human mind, the ingenuity that happened in Jaffa. He paid five grand for his camera. He still can't broadcast it to all the people in the United States who are now watching you. Wave hi. Say hi, Mom. That's what you do in this day. Say hi, Mom. Right? There's seven people watching it there. I don't even know who these people are, most of them. But they want to learn about the economics that you're learning about. What is the marginal cost of creating this and broadcasting it across the whole world? I'm really sorry. I didn't mean to insult you on your camera or anything, but it's zero. It's zero. There's 11 people now watching. I paid nothing to attract this audience, by the way. I got to them through my Twitter feed. By the way, everyone watching, that's Jose Pinera, the famous finance minister of Chile. <laughs> Give him a round of applause, the most revolutionary economist of our time. <laughs> so we just broadcast this around the United States. Don't, don't drink. It's not, it's not, you can't do that on television. <laughs> right? So the question we need to ask ourselves is, if innovation is so good, if it lowers your cost of living, one, why do so many people try to limit it? Two, what do we do about the people who are not part of this economy? And three, what's the third question? Everything goes in threes. What are you going to do about it? That's the third question. You always want to ask the question, not what somebody else is going to do, like John F. Kennedy said, right? But what are you going to do about it? You're not just going to sit here and listen to a lecture. You're actually going to go out and do something about it. Oh, one on audio only. Oops. Bad coverage here. Cell phones are also regulated. Cellular towers. So that's why you need that camera. You got no broadcast. My son wants to continue holding it. Anyway, so um, I was telling Jose before that I gave a lecture at the Finance Ministry Annual Conference. And my opening slide, it's why I don't do slides anymore, because someone took a picture of it, was a picture of the Shkata Avtala, whatever they call it here, the Shkata Ta which is the Unemployment Bureau. You know what their job is? To keep people unemployed. That's what they do. Why? I'll tell you a story about my friend Kobe, and you'll understand it. Kobe was in Shmona Matayim. That's that Israeli army unit that produces all the innovation. And he was the CTO of one of my companies. And after four years of vesting, he decided he wanted to take a break. So he did an experiment. He went to the Lishkat Ata'asukat, to the Unemployment Bureau, and he said, 
to himself, I'm going to donate whatever I make from them to charity, to education. I want to see what this is like, what people go through here. It's terrible. So he goes there and he says, well, what are you good at? He says, well, I'm good at computers. I was CTO of a company. And they said, CTO of a company? Yeah, and I was in Shimon time. So he said, you operate computers? He said, yes. They said, great, we have a job as a kupai, as a cash register. Someone who manages the cash register, and they sent him out to one of these supermarkets because he could operate computers. He lasted there how many days? 29. Why? Because at 30 days, they have to start paying him social security benefits. So one, the regulation of social security drove him out of a job. Two, he then found his way back to the unemployment bureau, where they continued to make him unemployed. I'll save you a long part of the story. Ultimately, they sent him to sweep streets in Tel Aviv because they said if you were fired from the supermarket, you're obviously not good enough at operating the computer. Now, don't think about Kobe. Think about somebody you know or don't know who was at Pre-Galil. He was stuffing vegetables in a can at a factory in the Galil. Somebody who was at Tefron, the textile company in the Negev. He's laid off from his job. Why is he laid off from his job? Where's that job gone? China, or somewhere else that's lower cost labor because that's what economics does. And then he turns up at the Unemployment Bureau. And what do they send him to do? Stuff a can somewhere else, maybe. Sew clothing at the next textile manufacturer, if he's lucky. Or to sweep streets. Why? Because they're trying to find him work. What should they try to find him instead? Education, skills. If you have the same skill set today and tomorrow, in an economy advancing as rapidly as the innovation economy we live in, you are toast. You will not get a job. You will be rendered unusable by things in the software of a cell phone. An app will replace you. You must consistently upskill yourself throughout your life. How many of you have read Reed Hoffman's book? What's it called again? I can't remember. I'm blanking on the name. Get it. Something out there, or something yourself. Yeah, something yourself. Anyway, the whole notion of career planning doesn't exist anymore unless you continue to get more educated and more advanced in your education as you go through life. And as Jose correctly said outside, if you're 55, you're not done yet. You're going to work till you're 70, 75 with the advances in medicine. Yes, you'll be working for 50 years. It's good. Work is good. Otherwise, you get bored. It's bad. So you want to continue to advance. So we need to look as an economy, not into how we find people jobs, but rather how we help them get skills. The government is the slowest moving thing that exists on the planet. It moves slower than the rotation of the earth. Okay? As fast as the economy keeps advancing, that's how much farther government gets behind. There is no way, there is not a snowball's chance in hell that the government can educate people into the skills they need to be competitive in an innovation economy. They can't, they won't, they're not able to. They don't have the skills themselves. The only way to do this is to figure out how we provide incentives vouchers, as we were talking about outside, for people to take them to companies, which are the advanced people in the economy, and let them get trained there. Give tax breaks to companies, because they pay too many taxes anyway, not like Shelly Yechimovich would have you believe, that they can invest, not in factories, but in people. Do you know that the law for capital, what's it called, the law for investment in capital something or other, Chokidudashkoton, do you know what it incentivizes? You can get a government grant if you do what? If you put iron and steel in the ground in Migdalemic. If you want to train somebody in Migdalemic to be a computer programmer, do you think you can get money from them? No. No. We are still living, as far as the government's concerned, in the industrial economy. But we've moved to an innovation economy, and they're far behind. We need to upskill people. The government doesn't believe in the human being. They actually don't. 
I said to this Ministry of Finance group, as they were going, uh, 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 I said to them, the one difference between me and you is that I believe in human beings and their ability to flourish, and you don't. You believe you need to be their patron, their parent. For some reason, I think parents can tell their kids what to do. Not my experience. They need to believe, believe that they can be their patron. In reality, they need to unleash them. They need to unleash human creativity and just to give them a chance to flourish in a free economy, in a free place. If you had an extra few hours and you could, you'd drive the Uber cab. It's better than flipping burgers. It's better than having your parents pay for your education. Trust me. But if I don't let you, you won't flourish. If I send you over to be a kupai, to be a cash register ringer, you won't flourish. If I enable you to be a computer engineer, I believe the guy who stuffs the cans can actually be a computer engineer. I'm going to finish with two last stories. Last story number one is about a home I'm trying to build. Has anyone tried to build a home in this country? I'm told it's the same in New York. Do you know how many people you need to sign a form in order to build a home? 16. At least where I'm trying to build it in your zikhron. 16 people need to sign a form. The health ministry, the, you know, the local guys, etc. Everyone needs to sign a form. Okay? There's a million rules. They don't want to let you build too much. You say it's reasonable. Why? Because I don't want to block somebody's view. Well, what if I want to build it underground? Who cares? Need a form for that and 100 people can object. How high are housing prices in this country? High, right? It's really high. That's a big issue for your election. How many homes are currently in building or planning phase? Does anyone know? 142,000. What is the average length it takes to get a home from when you submit planning or start to, you buy the land and submit planning to building the home? Does anyone know? Three and a half years. Three and a half years to build a home. Well, if the government didn't, wasn't so stingy with the land and it was a lot easier to work your way through the bureaucracy, who thinks that housing prices would come down? Trust me, the amount I've spent on lawyers trying to get unstuck is worth 10% of the housing cost. Just trying to get unstuck from the bureaucracy. This is choking our economy and raising your cost of living. It's making you work more hours in order to get to where you want to be. I want to tell one other story, now it's running away from me what it was. Ah. You should never talk in threes, right? <laughs> you always run out of the story. Um, right, I remember. One was the house that's choking off the economy and causing you to eat more, uh, causing you to pay more to do that. And I've completely lost my train of thought on the second, on the second story. So I'll finish with one last thought, which is, in an innovation economy, if we just let the people innovate and create their future for themselves and for other people, you'll find a remarkable reduction in the cost of living, a remarkable increase in the quality and prosperity of your life. And the other thing that happens is a little country like this in the information age, in the innovation age, where we're connected to everybody, we have ceased to become a country that will serve 8 million people, and we've become a country whose innovation can service 8 billion people. Meerkat didn't exist five, years, five weeks ago. Five weeks ago, it didn't exist. Today, it's in the hands of a million people broadcasting from all over the world. People in China are developing it for it. People in China are using it. It didn't exist five weeks ago. You can do all that from here. So in fact, the prosperity in this country from talented people means that if we can sell our goods and services and our brains and in innovation, and through upskilling people get more people into that cycle, we can bring income, bring economy from all over the world to this little place. And the last thing I just want to say to you, because I said to you, what are you doing, is the question is not how is the government providing upskilling for people in the economy. They won't do it. The question is not, are you going to wait 
till you run up against the same housing problem that I am. But you're all leaders, otherwise you wouldn't be here. You need to walk across the street to your neighbor who's less fortunate than you and take care of him. Hey, how can I help you get some skills? Where can I lead you? Can I teach you something? Jose was saying before he's studying from Harvard Online. Maybe I can show you how to use the computer and take classes at Harvard and Penn for free from around the world. It's so cheap to do it. All it takes is human will to help people out. In the same way that Moshe had responsibility and he went back to Egypt and said, we're going to let these people be free, we're going to help them achieve a better life, that responsibility is incumbent on every human being. Don't wait for the government. They won't do it. They can't do it. Which means that everybody needs to feel empowered and responsible to go do that on their own. And that's what I encourage you to do. As you get ready for Pesach, don't think about charity. That's important. Think about how you enable and empower other people to be as successful as you are and enjoy the fruits of the global economy. Thanks. First of all, as a computer science geek and a computer science major, you talk directly. Like, my professor is talking that this computer is like stronger than the one that brought us to the moon. Yep. The moon. It is. So exactly what you said, just, just talk into my soul. Good. So first of all, thank you for that. Now teach somebody else about computer science. Yeah. Now the second question is, maybe if you look at the case study of like Chile's pension revolution, how do you convince people to be free? How do you convince them to, you know, be a part of this revolution? To, I mean, why should I change my pension plan or why should I like be an Uber driver? I mean, it's easy. I can say it's easier that way. This is what I know. This is I don't want to change. People are afraid of changing. How do you convince someone to be free, to take responsibility for their actions? You've packed two things into one question. One is, what is about human psychology that will convince somebody that they should try to do better? Um, and then the second question you're asking is, how do you get them to a place that they can be better? And those are two separate questions. The second question is easier to deal with than the first one. The second question is, people, um, generally won't change until forced to. The forcing function comes from one of two things. I have no choice. Possibility number one. I think a large part of what's going on, for example, in the Haredi world, in the ultra-Orthodox world today, where people are going out to work, they have no choice. They can't support their families. Right? So either they're forced to, or because they've been inspired by an icon. We talk a lot at our fund about the fact that Israeli companies in the startup world we're mostly smaller companies that got sold for smaller prices. But our thesis is you can build big companies out of Israel. And the number one reason I think you can build big companies out of Israel today that you couldn't before is they're icons. Gil Shwed, who started Checkpoint, was successful and is an icon. Avishai Avraham, who started Wix, is successful as an icon. Amnon Shashua from Mobileye, built an $8 billion company from Jerusalem. He's an icon. When you have people you can look up to to do that, you feel like you can do it. We need to do something to make these people the icons of society. You mentioned Globes before. I don't have a very high regard for that publication, more for most of the newspapers here. But look at the pages of Globes and look who's in there. Politicians, the bank monopolies, the telecom monopolies. How many times do you see Amnon Shashua on the front page of Globes? None. How many times do you see him on educational television? None. How many times do you see Avishai Avrahami there? None. So as a society, we need to start to build icons and introduce them to the public who are successful. And that will inspire other people. Now, I grew up in New York. I wanted to be a Yankee baseball player. Thankfully, here, the icons should be entrepreneurs. I was unsuccessful at that. Right? That's what you want to be when you're a kid. You want to look up who the icons are. And who culture makes these icons you know, is, is what's important. I want to be like Nir Zohar. Nir Zohar is the COO and president of Wix. You know why? Because he's been very successful as a businessman and he donates 15% of his time and money to charity. God bless. That's what I want to be like. And that's what you should want to be like. Now, the psychology is complicated. Um, I think today, as a society, we look at unfortunate people poor people as unfortunate. They're not. They're not. They've been dealt a lousy hand in many cases. They grew up in an environment which wasn't supportive. 
The most important thing you can do is go over to someone and say, you can and I'm going to help you. Not with money, not with handouts. I'm going to be, I'm going to be your partner. I grew up more fortunate. I'm going to hold your hand, tap you on the shoulder, and take you with me until you're as fortunate as I am. And I think it's very important to instill in people's self-confidence that they can do it. But if you're not there all the time, slip back. So it's not their responsibility. It's your responsibility to figure out whose psychology you're going to influence to think that they can. Not everybody can be a software engineer. That's true. But everyone can do something more than they're doing now. Everybody. And if they can't, we'll figure it out as a society. But figuring out a society does not mean to say, go ring a cash register. Okay? It does not mean go sweep the streets. It means first we're going to try with everybody, because everybody can do more because we believe in you. We're going to enable you to see if you can do more. And we're going to support you in that. We're going to give you a stipend. We're going to give you enough cash so you can give a credit to Checkpoint to be a software engineer. Oh, I remember the story I wanted to tell. Thank you for reminding me. Here's a crazy story. You ready? There is a farmer in the Arava. He farms spices. He had 10 dunam of spices exposed to the elements. He had 40 Thailandi workers who walked all day up and down and picked the basil and the whatever it is. 10 dunam. Said guy gets an investment from an investor in the United States who wants to test robotic farming. And he says, what better place to do that than Israel? So he goes there, they buy robotic farming equipment from Holland, they bring it here. Same money, same thing, the guy sets up 40 dunams, 4x the production of robotic basil farming. He increases yield over 10x because technology does it. He needs only one thing, to replace his 40 Thailandis who walked up and down the thing with six people who can operate robots. He's looking for a year and a half. He still can't find them. Now, you don't mean to tell me that a guy from Pre-Galil, who stuffed cans, cannot be trained in 12 months to go from stuffing vegetables in a can and run it to running a robotic farm. He could. He doesn't have to write software code. We can figure it out. We don't try. We don't even try. So we can upskill a ton of people, a ton. Look what's going on with the Haridim today. They're upskilling really quickly. Now, it's hard to make up for 20 years of lost education. That's true. But they're actually making it in software engineering. They didn't take a you know, stitch of mathematics for 20 years. You just got to believe you can. So you said how much government is not very good at uh, making people uh, study more or become uh, more productive. Sure. And yet the basis of almost all successful Israeli entrepreneurships is, as you yourself mentioned, Shmone Matayim. Gil Shved, you mentioned Shmone Matayim. That's where most of the successful startup companies come from. Now, while it's clearly not exactly what they're trying to do there, it is based on government input, and without it, Israel would never be there. I'm so glad you said that. Thank you for asking that question. I really appreciate it. It's a fabulous question. The Army is the best-run organization in this government by far, by far, and Shimon Matayim and the Air Force are the best-run units outside of the government. We're you don't agree? I, as some of you didn't want to kind of actually disagree. Okay. <laughs> Look at the outputs. Where have you been in the army? Nowhere. Nowhere. But I've spent fair amounts of time within the units. But it doesn't matter. Look at the outputs. We have a tendency to measure, as a country, inputs. Right? We look how much money... Every year when they have the budget discussion, it's going to say how much money is going to the education ministry, how much money is going to the agricultural right. ministry. Inputs are not what's important. What's important is the output. And the outputs of Shwana Matayim are irrefutable. It's irrefutable. It's, the, it's, it's what's contributed almost 50% of the uh, export GDP of this country. It's irrefutable. Now, is it perfect? No, it's not perfect. But if you look at compared to the rest of the government ministry, it's pretty good. I'll tell you something else. I have an amazing story. Really, the launch of the high-tech economy in this country is actually not Shimon of a time. You know what it was? The Lavi fighter jet. The Lavi fighter jet, Israel tried to develop a fighter jet in the late 80s. And it was the most, supposed to be the most advanced fighter jet in the world. It failed as a project. Forget the fact that they made the plane work, etc. It doesn't matter. As a project, it never got off the ground. They spent billions of dollars, billions and billions of dollars, 
training people on the most advanced technology in the world, fighter jet. And then all these people spilled out into the economy. And that became the genesis of the Israeli technology economy here. So my argument, by the way, on that is pouring lots of money into a problem is actually not necessarily a bad idea for the government. And failing is also not necessarily a bad idea for the government. But if they're going to fail, they should fail in grand style and being way on the outer edge of technology. And what happens in Shmona Matayim, I think, you were there, right? Technology is their great end. What? You can't refute their great technology. Right. And they're on the bleeding edge of it. And they're telling these kids to do the wild, wild out things and be innovative and creative and go out on the edge and do it. And they spend tons of money on it. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. If you want to train people to be really good, you can spend tons of money and fail. My argument, by the way, with one of the Israeli government projects was the chief scientist, they scatter their money so wide and far, they actually get no output for it. It fails and no, no dent. Uh, by the way, interesting story, Better Place. Everyone knows Better Place? Is it a failure or a success? So on a company level, it was a giant failure. I'd argue on a national level, it was a giant success. Giant success. They brought in almost a billion dollars of equity to train people on smart energy grids. Again, it was a terrible investment. But we enriched the smarts of the national population dramatically on an important topic for the 21st century. So if you're going to fail, fail big. Is the Lazari government involved in that? Yes, as a matter of fact, the government gave subsidies, but worse than that, the government actually discouraged competition by granting them the only license to operate electrical vehicles in this country. Oops. Anyone else before? You? Ladies first. And I don't think actually that it's, it's because they're smarter or better because they came from Shimon Matayim. I think being an entrepreneur in the high tech field, in the startup field, it's much easier because you have less re government regulation. When you when you start a startup, you start it in your house, your environment. The government is less capable to interfere. But in other fields like public transportation, they say, how can I create a competition for the government in healthcare, in public transportation, in education? I can't create competition. High tech can because they can overcome those regulations. But so I'll tell you a story that happened, uh, what day is today? Sunday. On Thursday, I met a guy from McKinsey. Um, and he said the following. Maybe it's true, maybe it's not. He um, said that Luxembourg gives you, if you open a financial management firm in Luxembourg, you can then service the entire EU. Because of Israel's agreements with the EU on financial transfers, you can actually take money from Israeli investors and savers and put it in a bank incorporated and registered and licensed in Luxembourg. So his idea, if I even know what Wealthfront is in the States, it's this new asset management firm built entirely on the internet, right? Amazing what's going on there. It's incredible. It's my former partner, Andy. So proud of him. He's awesome. You can create Wealthfront for Israel and register it in Luxembourg. So what you'll do is you'll seek out pockets and regulation until the government wakes up here. That'll take a lot of time, unless Jose wants to come here and serve as our finance minister. And and find pockets by going to Luxembourg. Or you'll find a pocket in education. You know, you can set up private education in this country. There's an experimental school in Ramada Sharon now where they've taken the education out of the government's hands. Some donor gave them money because they can't get education ministry funding by doing that to start it. And they're innovating the education model. Now all of a sudden, everyone wants to go there, and the government's turned up. And they're all angry, of course, because somebody's stealing their students because the education's better. Right? And, but this guy said... Sorry, we got a school, go away. So you can start by creating competition to the government through pockets and regulation, you can do this. Uber's trying to figure this out. Uber figured this out all across the United States, how they drive a wedge through regulation and get there. In a smaller country, it's actually harder on some level. But we will, we will, this is what I'm saying. People like you will come out victorious against the bureaucrats. It's inevitable. You just have to not give up. They have, their strategy is to wear you down. That's the strategy. Don't give up. You'll make the change. 
I'm not sure if it's open to discussion, but I wanted to say about you asked about Torn Matai as an example for a good governmental organization. I completely disagree. That's that's not a good organization like as a governmental because it's not. I mean, if you take any high tech company, I work in a high tech company and I know it's good because no one wants to go out. Nobody we want to stay there. So there's no union organizations. People don't because the employee gives us all the benefits we need because he knows if not we'll go somewhere else. We have this competition. And Shimon and Time is exactly a not it's not a good example because most of the people in Shimon and Time don't stay there. I mean, do you have a few officers, but if that's a good company, that after three years, everyone wants to leave, I mean, all, if it was a good company, people would stay. It will become something like, I don't know, the biggest company ever, but it's not. There, there's there's, there's other values. I, I, I mean, but people get paid in different ways. You get paid with money, and you also get paid with sipuka nefesh, with doing things that are important for the country. And those are all valuable currencies. So I wouldn't be so down with Shimon Matan. I think he's no, done something pretty incredible. No, I, I'm not. I feel, but, but, but no, I actually feel what I'm saying because right now, Shimon and time is very good at helping the country out indirectly sure. by creating manpower that's very successful and whatever. But internally, for its own goals, it's not holding up to its own exactly. goals enough that's, now. That's, well, that needs, that needs, what does it need? No, Not more money. Not. It needs to attract better talent to make it work better. <coughs> it has the best talent. They can't manage it right. All right, well, replace the manager. That's just <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Thank okay. you. Thank you.